I really want to talk about how the uh, open and collaborative process that the direct project used mm -hmm. could be used for other problems yeah. that we're trying to solve, big problems that we're trying to solve in government, energy, education, and so forth. Well, thank you. Let me begin by just saying when the president called for a chief technology officer in the White House, part of what he wanted to do is to take these principles of openness in government and to scale them across the entire enterprise. So that was actually my first homework assignment. Not to do a specific initiative like the direct project, but to think about the broader policy environment to nurture more of these so they can happen in every federal agency. So I'm going to answer this question in three parts. The first thing that we did in setting the conditions by which the direct project existed was we held every federal agency accountable for principles of participation and collaboration. That is to say, lowercase g government, how can we get the national interests achieved by collaborating with individuals where we may do nothing but simply put up a website, maybe hire a project manager, maybe do a little bit more to seed the ecosystem, but more than anything else, bring neighbors together to solve common, very difficult problems. So we've, number one, made an accountable uh, framework so that every federal agency has to describe what it is that they're going to be doing in their words to take the president's philosophy and to Im implement this. The second thing that I'm doing is I'm trying to create a policy framework specifically around standards that takes what we've learned in projects like direct and others and to try to build an evidence base that there's an opportunity here for government to think about this as a more of a scientific endeavor that can be scalable and not a one-off. So under the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, NIST, at nist.gov, we have published a request for information asking the American people for input on how the government should go about engaging in standards activities. For years, we've been governed under a framework called OMB Circular A119. And what it basically does is tells us what the government should not do. It says that the government should not write its own standards and dictate them on the private sector. Well, that's great, but what do we do? Short of that, do we engage by defining a problem and challenging people to solve it? Do we provide support to the ecosystem? Do we staff in any which way, shape, or form? Do we nudge, inspire, encourage? So the request for information right now is the second pillar, which is get me the evidence base so we can engage in the policy discussion. Should ideas like the direct project be a staple of how our government works? And the third thing is I'm managing the next round of projects. So already, we have scaled up on buildings energy efficiency. The president announced a Bu Better Buildings Initiative uh, a few weeks back when he visited one of our regional innovation clusters in Pennsylvania. Part of that program is to think about how we develop standards for electricity data gathering. You know, here's funny, Brian. If you get an electricity bill every month, do you get it in electronic format? Can you download it from a utility? I wish. No, you get it as a single item at the end of the month, and that's your bill. Imagine a federal commercial building, I mean a, a federal building or a commercial building. How do they get data from the utility companies? So if we had a bit of a similar model of in 90 days, let's get specs for how the utility sector should report uh, energy data. We think there's a lot we can do here building off of the work we've done thus far on smart grid standards. And there, uh, for those of you who are following smart grid standards, uh, we've produced something called the PAP10 standard, which is the method by which people should communicate to consumers about energy data. And now we want to work collaboratively with commercial buildings owners using the government's footprint as the case study here to drive some consensus activities on how to move that data. So we're going to do this in energy. We announced a similar initiative in learning technologies. The president announced we're going to have a learning registry at the Department of Education. So all the federally funded content that is helpful to achieve some algebra or reading or some other critical educational program, we're going to have common data standards so people can find that content and incorporate that into their lesson plans. That's fantastic. Pulling it back in, just uh, we uh -huh. are at HIMSS. Yes. It's all about healthcare and information technology. It here. is. And uh, really exciting uh, information you guys shared today. But one Thank thing you. that really struck me was talking about uh, accountable care organizations, yep. patient-centered medical homes, yep. and building the technology platform. Yep. Uh, that's going to enable that, and uh, and uh, for instance, the Blue Button Initiative. Yeah. Big fan of the work there, and then also finally, um, you know, I've heard a lot today about government and their role as convener mm -hmm. and collaborator. Mm -hmm. You know, what Tim O'Reilly likes to say, government as a platform for innovation, Correct. which has been sort of a theme throughout much of the conference so far. Here. Yes, and uh, if you could just speak on that briefly. Well, let me broaden the discussion first with what is our thesis coming into the room today. 
We believe there's never been a better time to be a healthcare innovator than today. The combination of the changes in our healthcare delivery system, the incentives by which the healthcare system should operate, combined with the opportunities to liberate information, incentives and information liberation, we believe, will combine to deliver that rocket fuel for innovation. So that's the message we're carrying forward to HIMSS. And what we were saying is, on the incentives piece, if hospitals and doctors today can get rewarded financially if they keep us healthy, then we create the market conditions for a whole new set of IT-enabled services to support them in making the kinds of judgments they need to make to do that. So if you're a primary care doctor and you need to refer a patient to a cardiologist, which cardiologist do you refer to? What information do you have to know which of those referring cardiologists deliver the best value for the dollar spent? That information doesn't really exist today, but under the Affordable Care Act, we'll have more quality transparency in the care uh, uh, for providers. We'll have more information liberation that can help us identify areas like price and other services. And we'll have new tools to provide uh, public health data so that we would know in this community we should be particularly mindful of concerns around infant mortality because we happen to have a higher than national average rate and therefore particular emphasis on, on, on the care delivery for young mom, uh, moms uh, and, and pregnant moms would be the uh, top priority. So we think having the payment incentives change, having information liberated both from a public health situational awareness context and from providers in terms of their own uh, electronic health records combined to make the market conditions for what we're saying today. It's time for entrepreneurs to get in the game. That's the message for HIMSS and we believe that that's something we're going to be doing not just in talk but in action and you saw that with programs like the Direct Project and Blue Button and others that are in that same spirit. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to speak. My pleasure. Today. Thank you for having me. Data liberation. That's right. Todd, my brother. Cheers.